we, we were talking about Gordon Liddy, right. and uh, you also had an occasion to interview Bud Crow. Uh, yeah, I did. Um, Crow, uh, as, as you know, was uh, sort of second in command of the plumbers units, and he was in, my recollection is, in Allenwood, uh, Pennsylvania prison. And uh, we made arrangements with the Bureau of Prisons. Again, I think you know it required John's intervention to have Bud, or Eagle Crow was his name, brought to us. And I, I wanted to get his cooperation, so I asked them if they could have his wife there. And um, they did arrange that. And we met at a facility, I think, in Baltimore somewhere. And, and he was brought down. And of all things, he was in shackles. They had leg irons. and risk manacles and I thought this is not the way to get his cooperation <laughs> and so we I asked them to please unshackle. They didn't want to. They wanted me to interview him in irons so to speak. But anyway they did and Crow was an interesting fellow because I think I think I described him as a boy scout. He, he really was a true believer that what he had been asked, anything he was asked to do by the president was almost by definition uh, proper and in the best interest of the country. But once this all blew up, he took on this sort of guilt complex and, and blamed himself for uh, the not stopping it, not seeing the, the direction that the plumbers were going, that the break-ins they were conducting couldn't possibly be legal and so on, and that he had, should have recognized that and brought, uh, put an end to it. I think that's an unfair guilt load. Uh, but of course, we were interested in whether or not he received instructions from the president, so that the, the link was there. And uh, I, I, he never got directions from President Nixon: go break in something, go, go do wiretaps. Uh, he he just didn't get that kind of instruction. I, I think it was obvious from what he told us that in some of his, and he only had a few conversations with the president, uh, that that. Uh, the president knew at least that wiretapping was going. I don't know that he knew about the, the, the break-ins as such, uh, or when he knew, but uh, Crow, when he finished his sentence, I know that uh, he applied for uh, readmission to the California bar, and uh, several of us on the staff asked uh, John Doerr, if it was all right for us to write kind of letters of recommendation, because I do think he's a sort of a clean-cut character, and, and if anybody in the world would never go astray again, uh, would be way on the other side of the line, it's him. Uh, so, uh, But it was an interesting experience. Uh, he did get a little time uh, with his wife, and so uh, maybe that gave us some goodwill. Um, how difficult was it for you to uh, determine presidential involvement in the plumbers? Uh, well, some of it was inferential. Uh, some of it you could tell from the tapes, uh, once you heard them, was that because the president commented to Dean and to others on the tapes about activities that the plumbers had been doing, that he knew about it. Uh, in some instances, of course, it ran through John Mitchell, the, that is, the plumbers' activities, and in others, collateral figures like Dr. Kissinger, uh, whose signature or initials are on the authorizations, so or I say that, that, there's a set of authorizations from uh, Hoover for these wiretaps, and they recite that Dr. Kissinger called and asked me to do this, and then he puts his, uh, sort of had a funny little scribble that was his mark. Uh, and obviously Mitchell and, and Kissinger were at the very highest levels of, uh, of the Nixon administration. Um, I don't think Dr. Kissinger was interested in the political side of it at all. I mean, th that is, the wiretaps degenerated into that. <clears throat> he was interested in what he viewed as national security leaks, uh, and that was the original cover for the wiretaps, but it, they certainly expanded into something quite different. But it's clear from the tapes and, and the uh, testimony of others that the president knew about that. And, and he was receiving reports through Haldeman and others about what the wiretaps were generating. So, uh, 
but to say that you could find uh, a, a direct order from the president, go break in somewhere, I, I, you, there never was that. You couldn't find that. Um, you mentioned that Dick Cates had this uncanny ability to predict what what the tapes would say. Was that because you and he were developing a theory of presidential responsibility? No. The query was whether or not there was presidential responsibility. But Dick was able to say <coughs> from a, you know, his both his skills and experience that look, if if the parties here on tape number one are discussing this or doing that and over here this event occurs. There has to be a connecting set of events and you could by, I don't know whether it's inductive or deductive reasoning, you could say necessarily this had to have happened in between and, and it did. It turned up on the other tapes that we got later. So uh, that's the process but uh, it certainly was not with a preconception. Uh, but that was our charge, was what was the President's involvement. Uh, so we had to make the query is, can it either be found or inferred? Um, how did you come to the conclusion that the Segretti, uh, so the Segretti story was a sideshow and was irrelevant? Well, we actually interviewed Segretti. <laughs> um, and he was kind of almost a college prankster. <coughs> I mean, I, he did things like ordering hundreds of dollars worth of pizzas delivered to the Republican headquarters and charging, I mean, to the Democratic headquarters and charging them. Yeah, you know, so they'd spend money and be confused. It was, it was really silly stuff at the end of the day. I, we never found anything of consequence, frankly, in, the, uh, in his activities. Uh, I don't want to say he was a prankster, it was a little more than that, but it, it just didn't have the, the gravity uh, and certainly not the presidential level involvement that uh, other things did. Uh, did you interview Charles Colson? Uh, we did. Uh, Dick Cates and I interviewed Colson twice, I think, may have been three times, but uh, uh, and um, I have to tell you, and I probably, in the public eye, this is a minority view, I guess, we concluded that what, what Mr. Colson was doing was a kind of a scam. He was a very high-ranking official, of course. He was in the, publicly known to be high in the administration. And he had made an announcement that <coughs> he had decided to tell all, to, to uh, unburden his soul, so to speak. And we conclude, uh, but what he told us in the interviews were not matters of consequence. Uh, and we concluded that it was deliberate. That by saying I'm going to tell all and I had the ear of the president and all doesn't amount to much. It infers there wasn't much there. And so we actually recommended at the end of these to the committee that he not be called as a witness because <clears throat> we didn't think his testimony was going to be truthful and we thought it was deliberately misleading in the sense that I described. And, but the political pressures were terrific. Uh, the committee wanted to not only get a full picture but certainly to be seen to be getting a full picture. And if you don't call the highest ranking official in the administration who has said, I'm going to tell all, and you don't even hear from him, it doesn't look as if you're getting the full picture or even interested in it. It looked like, you know, it was slanted. So he was called as a witness. And uh, I remember Congressman Hungate had a break after Mr. Colson had testified for a morning or I don't remember, but some period of time. Uh, behind the committee chamber there, I mean, there was a break room where you could get coffee and things. And he turned to me and he said, he said well, he said, you and Cates told us about this. That uh, <coughs> uh, I understand, though, that Mr. Colson says he's found the Lord. He 
said, after all that testimony in there under oath that he's given, he better hope the Lord doesn't find him. And uh, so uh, I don't think Mr. Colson's testimony to the committee ended up accomplishing what he hoped it would. And uh, uh, I think it was a, an effort to exonerate the president through this appearance that I've told all and all is not of an impeachable quality. So, but he did testify, and um, uh, I don't think the committee believed him. What was it that gave you a sense that he was trying to scam? Gosh, it's a long time, uh, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. Partly it's, you observed him, you, and the pieces didn't fit together. It, they didn't fit with some of the information that was on tapes. They didn't fit with some of the memos and things that uh, were in the possession of the committee. Uh, it didn't, the story wouldn't hold together under careful cross-examination, which is what a trial lawyer does. And so you had to ask yourself, what is he not telling and, and why? And so that was the conclusion we reached from it. Now, I suspect, and I guess he's still alive, I suspect he would adamantly disagree with that. Um, it was always interesting, wasn't it, that he, he found the money for the, the break-in. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and the money for, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it was him alone, but the money for the lawyers, uh, for those people. Um, and, of course, this is the sort of thing. Dick Cates and I went to interview the lawyer for... Um, Bitman? Did you interview Bitman? Yes, we did. A uh, lawyer for Hunt. Right. And he had pled, he had agreed to plead Hunt guilty to all the charges. And I think he got the maximum sentence. And Dick asked him, said, you know, and I was paid $300,000. And he said, Mr. Bitman, let me see if I get this right. You paid $300,000 to plead your client guilty on all charges and get sentence to the maximum. He says, what did you do for $300,000? He said, I could have done that for $300. And so, uh, you know, it, it was pretty clearly a funnel for the money to, as, as, as it's turned out after everything else has become known. Uh, but Mr. Bittman didn't say it was a funnel. No, he did not. <laughs> he did not. Uh, uh, tell us about uh, what role, if any, you played in deciding how this information would be made available to the committee? Well, I didn't play any role on that. Uh, John Doar's code, if you will, was we're not going to make any statement of something as being a fact unless we can document from sworn testimony or documents that it is a fact. If it is an inference from facts, it's got to be clearly identified as such. And so he wanted, he's the one who, and I say he, he may have consulted with, with Bob Fisk and uh, others, you know, uh, I mean Owen, Owen Fisk and Bob, Robert Fisk, who is dead now, but about the structure to call the statements of information. And if you, if you look at them, there is just that. There's a statement of what we believed to be a fact. And then underneath it is the source or sources. And either testimony of somebody, document of this, recording of that. So uh, I didn't have any role in that. We were told to structure and write our reports in that format. And it was a way to test whether what we thought were the facts. All right, where can you prove it? Um, uh, how, how much time did it take you to, to prepare your volumes because your actually your, your work is covered in uh, at least one volume that I recall. I, I think it's two, but, yeah. but I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I've got that set of those That's great right. books. Uh, I, I can't tell you that. I mean, it's not that I won't tell you that. No, no, no. I, no. I, I just, it was an ongoing process because we were told to do that. and. Facts came in, you'd go back and plug them in so that the story made sense. The, the statements of information were a story as well, uh, chronologically and uh, connectively, uh, 
way you put together all the facts about a given thing. And, I mean, for example, the wiretaps. You start with the question of how were the wiretaps authorized? And then what did they, who did they wiretap? What did they get uh, when they wiretapped them? How did they collate that? Because only small bits of the wiretap materials went upstream to Haldeman and to the president. They called out a lot of it that was not deemed relevant to why they were wiretapping. I mean, that's one of the ways you could tell why was the selection process. It was a, if there were four pages of a conversation and they only reported a paragraph's worth, then the rest of it wasn't what they were interested in. And so you could pick out the pattern of, of why they were doing it. Uh, so all that was told in a story uh, and with the supporting materials. And then other aspects of it were told, you know, but it had to be able to be read through and make sense. And so that was always an ongoing thing. Uh, you were writing it and filling in the supporting materials for over a period of weeks and months, really, until the process ended. Um, when did you start feeling comfortable that you were getting the, did you get a sense that the, 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 the puzzle was coming to or the picture was getting clearer for you? I know I went home and the only time I went back to Montgomery during this was at Easter. And I think Easter was in April that year, early April as opposed to March. And I went to see Judge Johnson who wanted to uh, see how it was going and he had been after all the pathway as to why I was there and talked to him about it and uh, it was clear that we had gotten the first group of tapes uh, and uh, those of course we had to listen to and I forget there were six or seven of us who were authorized to actually hear them and we had a closed room that was soundproof that it couldn't you couldn't have an, somebody who was across the street with a, a mic pick up book and you had to listen to them through a headset so it sort of it couldn't it wasn't broadcast in the room in general and it was a lot of elaborate rigmarole but those certainly um, confirmed much of what the, the written materials had suggested uh, and it certainly gave a tone uh, that, that is so clear in there. And, and reading the tapes is pretty shocking in some ways, but hearing them is more so. Uh, and, but I know by Easter I reported to Judge Johnson that I thought the President was in trouble. Uh, and I had no idea what the Congress, I didn't deal, that wasn't my level. Uh, I mean, you, we got to know, and we did, there's an incident of, when we get to it about Hamilton Fish. Uh, uh, who was one of the members, but um, I, I think certainly by mid-April uh, we, we were pretty clear where it was going. Now, there were things were being thrown overboard uh, that, I mean, we never had any charges associated with Segretti. Uh, in a reflection, the Cambodian bombing business shouldn't have been in there. Uh, you know, it, it, while it had political overtones, it just didn't seem to us. At the end of the day, it was included, but it was not adopted uh, as, a, as one of the articles. Uh, that was one of Bob Sachs' categories, so I like, we like to kid him that some of his didn't get the same vote. But uh, uh, I, I think that's accurate, because we started presenting the materials by the end of May uh, and June, is, is my recollection. Uh, yes, uh, beginning of May, 8th, May 9th, actually. Okay. Um, the, the tapes that you were listening to had been brought over by the White House Special Prosecution Force. They'd been given to you by them. That's right. And so you started listening to them in early April. That's right. Before the White House issued its transcript. It's dirty blue book, as it was called. <laughs> so you had this experience of, uh, it, not you necessarily personally, but at least the staff, having listened to these tapes and then having the White House issue its own version of the transcripts right. of the same tapes that you've been listening to. That's right. And it's funny, uh, the Supreme Court decision, and I can't date it, I'm sorry, I should be able to. July 24th. 
Um, but we, um, Bob Sack and I were dispatched to the Supreme Court as the representatives of the Congress to hear the Supreme Court deliver that opinion. And it's got to be one of the most peculiar days in history. I mean, a very solemn occasion in the court. And we didn't have anything to say, but, but he and I had both been admitted to practice before the court, so we were entitled to sit inside the rail, so to speak, uh, as, as representatives of Congress. And we, they had a little gold eagle that we wore in lapels that gave us access. I mean, it was sort of a pass key to ask government officials things. And when we came out after hearing it and listening to the rationale of the court, there were all these demonstrators out in front of the uh, uh, Supreme Court building, both pro and against the president. And some of them had on those masks of, uh, of the president. And, a lot of them had signs, and they were marching around about impeach the president, uh, pro Nixon, and chanting, and and we didn't want the crowd to know who we were. They wouldn't have recognized either of us, you know, of course, in any way, unless they re realized we had on. So we kind of, <laughs> you know, hid those, and uh, and the, the committee may have started the vote or the committee statements from the representatives that night uh, <coughs> because there was a. There was a threat of a kamikaze plane coming. Now, this is, of course, long before 2011. Uh, was going to crash into the Capitol. I mean, it was a rumor. I don't know where it came from, but there was a lot of alarm about it, and there were questions: should they hold the session because they were held in the evenings? And um, and then uh, I think a number of very profound things were said by a number of the congressmen. Uh, they didn't all speak that same night. I mean, it went on over more than more than a, one evening. But that all occurred in a, you know, a single session. And I mean, it's just an astonishing bit of history to have been there. Uh, um, well, so you said there was a, there was a, a threat that was reported? That there was. That uh, someone, some one, and they called it a kamikaze. Uh, a plane was going to crash into the Capitol. And I don't know anything about the source of the threat, or you know, obviously there was enough credibility about it. There was a lot of buzz and running around, uh, questions about whether we ought to adjourn the session, that sort of thing. But it didn't turn out to amount to anything. Tell us about the subpoenas. You were going to tell us a story about. Well, the the issue of whether whether that whether you should I guess whether you should issue subpoenas. And that's right, and and. A number of the members of the committee, and of course you have to understand the partisan politics were ongoing. There were uh, some members of the Republican minority who we felt had been put on there for the purpose of being true partisans. I mean, it didn't matter what the facts, uh, they, they, were, they were the president's men on the committee, there were a couple of them. Uh, didn't want subpoenas issued. Uh, the, the subpoena process was cumbersome. Uh, if a person disobeyed, disobeyed a congressional subpoena, the enforcement was cumbersome. It wasn't as if there were court proceedings readily available and you know, a judge could snatch them in and cite them for contempt. You had to go through a process of contempt of Congress. So it was an awkward process. And uh, I know it came up in connection with getting the wiretap materials, the, that is the actual transcript. Justice Department, FBI did not want to turn them over. They uh, professed to have concerns that they were invasion of privacy of the people who were wiretapped. And we said, well, it's a little late to be thinking about that. Why <laughs> wasn't the invasion when you did it, as opposed to us getting it? And we had we said, well, we can subpoena them. They said, well, we'll resist them. They, you know, that'll take you weeks to sort that out. And so finally, John Dorr asked me to go with him because I was the one who at least knew what we were asking for and, and, and the detail. And so we went down and met with uh, an assistant U.S. assistant, I don't know what his title was in the Justice Department, but it, it, I think he's now a federal judge, uh, Silverman. And he was a friend of Dorr's. They'd been colleagues. And 
John said to him, said, you know, this is, you got to consider what this is. We're not the criminal courts. This is a solemn constitutional proceeding, and we need this. And they didn't want to do it, and finally I remember John saying, said, well, you know, if you read the Constitution, articles of impeachment can be brought against any federal official, or any person holding public office. And he says, Representative Drynan, who uh, was one of the leading Democrat firebrands on the committee, said, said he's got impeachment resolutions made out in blank. And he said, you're liable to be the next one if, if you won't cooperate. And so they ruminated and decided to give them to us on the uh, condition that we obscure the names. And so I was given that task, and I have to say it didn't, my code writing it was not very skillful. I, I gave them letter designations and, you know, that sort of thing. And I think the press figured it out pretty quick who was who. But uh, uh, we did get them, and we were able to draw conclusions, as I said, about why were they doing this. And, and the materials they reported upstream to Alderman uh, gave us a clue and what was omitted and, you know, there was a lot of stuff on there about people's private conduct and things that, that uh, nobody was very interested in except sometimes it was used for political leverage, obviously, in, in the political matters memoranda you can see evidence of that. Uh, but anyway, that, the, we didn't subpoena them, they turned them over under this arrangement, but it was done under sort of coercion. Um, so you concluded, therefore, that although they may have been begun for national security reasons, ultimately the wiretaps were used for political reasons. We did. We, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was fairly evident that that's what it became. Um, tell us about the camaraderie on the staff. Because you're working so hard, you're under such pressure, and you're all supposed to be tight-lipped. Um, how did you how did you blow up steam? Well, you know that's interesting. The tight lipped is is fascinating because I think it's the only major investigation in congressional history from which there were no leaks. Uh, Doyle had told us at the outset that he did not want any. That we had a duty. Our client was the Congress. Lawyers don't discuss clients' business, and we didn't. And nobody, although we got calls, several of us got calls. I, I, I got one from somebody on Jack Anderson's staff, and uh, we immediately referred it to our security officer and uh, didn't respond to him. But all of the lawyers were young or youngish. I mean, Bert, Jenna, and John Doyle were senior, obviously, but, and Bernie Nussbaum was maybe three years older than, than Bob and Evan, and Evan's actually a year or two younger than I am. And, uh, and, and then many of the staff people, like Hillary, were younger still. But everybody was, it was an amazing group. They, they were clever people, they were bright people, they were dedicated people. But they also had, Bob particularly, had a wonderful sense of humor and, uh, and kept everybody kind of, you know, together. Because it, it did get long. If you're there till four in the morning, day after day and you're getting three or four or five hours sleep uh, and coming back to it, uh, weekends uh, included. Uh, it got wearing, but I, I think it's a tribute to, to the people John chose uh, and uh, how he reminded us that we were, had an important duty and uh, purpose of why we were there. And so uh, it's been a, I, I told him, I had an occasion to have done it with him. He actually came to Montgomery on some business uh, a few months ago. And I, I said, you know, among other things that you did, and I think he's a great man, I think he did great things, I said, you forged a network of friends that s exists to this day uh, where we, we all regard each other, you know, as special lifetime friends. And, uh, so, and that's a tribute to him and his leadership. But we had we had funny things. We had a quasi 
Easter day, uh, uh, Easter weekend, because I went home that for two days that weekend. But uh, observance and um, but it is interesting about camaraderie at the very end when the president announced his resignation. And we realized uh, that that part, at least, uh, was over. And although we were going to stay to put it all into some meaningful form, uh, and some of us had thought we were going to stay for the Senate trial, uh, we wouldn't have, I mean, I wouldn't have been. I wasn't senior enough to be lead any kind of counsel, you know, but we'd have, si have assisted. Uh, we went around to a number of little places there, uh, on, up behind the Capitol, where you know beer joints and things. And I remember there were a group of people that I would have described as hippies, uh, just long hair and beads and things. And they were whooping it up. We got him. We got him. And all of us were kind of saddened about that, uh, and thought that's not the right reaction. It, you know, however you view it, it's a tragedy, and uh, this this outcome. It may have been necessary, and it may have been appropriate in the constitutional system, but it's still a tragedy, and it's not the we got him business. Uh, that, that's wrong, and uh, we didn't stay very long. And they didn't know who we were, of course, and we, we left.